Lecture 7, Global Sport Workers. In this lecture, we're going to make a shift from athletic laborers to the workers and workers' bodies, those who are involved in the manufacturing of sport-related products, specifically sport footwear and apparel industry workers, and they are located around the globe, as you probably know. So we're going to look at them in this topic, and we'll explicitly focus on the distribution and experience of these workers and how that distribution, where those workers are and how they are working uh, while they're working for or who they're working for, uh, is really a reflection of broader trends and relations within the global economy. So if we go back to some earlier thoughts we had about distribution of hierarchies between core and periphery countries, again, I think we see those relationships and those hierarchies playing out here uh, in this example. And before I go on, I should probably say that there is a swoosh for Nike, uh, the Nike symbol, the Nike sign. Um, we may focus on Nike specifically. Uh, why Nike? Well, it's the most visible and high profile of all of the corporations in the sports apparel and footwear industry. So that's why we're going to focus on Nike a lot in this topic, but I want to remind you that it's not the only example. So the things we're talking about here, yes, Nike is related to those, but so too is Adidas, so is Under Armour, Puma, Keds, really anyone involved, any global multinational involved in the sports footwear and apparel industry. Nike is perhaps perhaps the best example, but not the only example. So we have a lecture outline as always, and we have four distinct topics. The first one is quite broad, where we're going to look at the deindustrialization and the global economy. And more generally, then we'll look at the sports industry more specifically in relation to that. So that's where we're going to stop. Now this title gives it away, and it's really about the industrialization and the industrial decline and the offshoring within the global economy that we're going to focus on. And what we're going to see is that uh, we hinted at a number of times in this class already is that the U.S. industrial era is the era of mass industrial production, which lasted roughly between 1880 and 1970. Not that there is no industrial production in the U.S. anymore, uh, mass, heavy indu mass heavy industry, but it's not at the same level as it was once before. So from the 1970s onward, we can see a definite decline in those sectors of mass heavy industrial manufacturing in the United States. And here we have it. So this is the U.S. labor force, and it uh, bisects, and, and really it's quite fascinating uh, to look at. And you can see the American economy. It's gone from two different directions, from effectively manufacturing to service. So it can be said that we live in a service-centered economy. Just gives uh, a, an example of that with some statistics. And you can look at the decline in agriculture, uh, the uh, increase relative in uh, industry over a period of time, uh, and then ultimately a decline as service sector employment uh, rises. And we talked about this process of industrialization uh, of the U.S. and the decline of the nation's manufacturing base and manufacturing capacity, uh, its industrial output. And basically, so we're looking around many cities and the number of these uh, taken from Detroit, which is kind of the archetypal example of the industrial city in America, are referred to as the Rust Belt. And, and this is the Rust Belt because the factories that produced all of the manufactured goods are quite literally lying in ruin. They are rusting. The plants, the industrial machinery, it's an indication of the industrializing process that has been replaced by two other, by other things. So that's the decline of the nation's industrial manufacturing capacity and its outputs, and it's reflected in these rust belt cities such as Pittsburgh and Cleveland and Milwaukee uh, and Chicago to some extent. So what was the real reason for the decline in American mass industrialism and its manufacturing capacity? Well, there are a number of different reasons we need to think about. First is the strength of the economy in post-World War II. And it meant that the real wages and the lifestyle of individuals increased. So people became more affluent, they demanded higher wages, and as a result, the manufacturing process became more expensive because it costs more money to pay your workers to make the products. And so there was a negative effect on American affluence in terms of mass industrial workforces. Uh, and they were, of course, in turn, as uh, they were making uh, more and more commodities, they were demanding higher wages, and it made it less profitable for companies to make products by hiring American workers. 
Secondly, in the early 1970s, there was a massive global oil crisis caused by an embargo from OPEC, the oil and petroleum countries, which put an embargo and it stopped the supply of oil to the rest of the world. And as a result, this crisis jumped oil prices virtually overnight. Imagine, since oil is such an important part of the manufacturing and distribution process, that all parts of the industrial process and in manufacturing suddenly became much more expensive because of this knock-on effect of this crisis. So now, not only does labor cost more, and is the labor more expensive in the production, but so too are increased oil prices. And this gradual increase in the production of commodities as a result of these two um, factors uh, led to a transformation uh, in the manufacturing process. So as a result, companies started to look to thing, look at things, and the, they, these were the reasons for deindustrialization, uh, outsourcing and offshoring. Now, people use these terms interchangeably, but they are slightly different. You can outsource without having to offshore, but you cannot offshore without outsourcing. Uh, simply put, outsourcing is when you contract a part of the manufacturing process to another company. Now, that company can be down the road from you. It could be in a different country. Uh, you are outsourcing it somewhere. So if you're producing a car, maybe you outsource the production of the wheels to another company and you purchase those pre-fabricated or pre-made wheels uh, into your own factory. Now, that outsourced company that manufactures the wheels could be anywhere in the world. Offshoring is usually what we talk about when we mean uh, outsourcing. Offshoring is the relocation of part of the manufacturing process itself or, um, or the entire manufacturing process to another country. So when we offshore jobs, we are relocating them to the manufacturing parts of uh, another country. So outsourcing and offshoring are linked, but they are subtly different. In my example of the manufacturing of a car, outsourcing could be uh, you have a U.S. company, but you've, uh, you're assembling all of the cars from its various um, constituent parts in uh, Taiwan, for instance, where labor is cheaper, and then you bring the cars to U.S. market. So that would be outsourcing as it's different than, uh, sorry, that would be uh, offshoring as it's different than outsourcing. Now, what made this attractive was that there were developing industrial countries that had lower labor costs, and oftentimes they worked less uh, hours, there were less uh, regulations in the workplace, so American companies could look abroad for cheaper labor and cheaper forms of manufacturing uh, and offshore their production there and outsource it oftentimes uh, and subcontract it with foreign companies. So that was one of the things that the industrial economies uh, elsewhere brought, that they would allow the capacity uh, to be taken offshore, the capacity of manufacturing processes to be taken offshore. So the production and trade barriers that uh, made it easier for U.S. corporations to go to these foreign markets and relocate the production of their material products. Previously, it was much more difficult to do this because of trade barriers that stopped this type of movement between one country and another. But from the 1970s onward, as a result of these changing uh, conditions, trade barriers were reduced and the flow of goods and the flow of money between countries allowed this offshoring to happen much more effectively. Now the industrialization was largely the result of that offshoring and outsourcing uh, and it was promoted, it was prompted by perceived increases in the costs to manufacture uh, and they reduced it in this way. There are now lower investment costs when you offshore. And when you offshore to somewhere else, th the manufactured products, the corporation doesn't have to pay for the plant of or, or facilities. You are subcontracting it to someone else. So a company may not own the physical plant where the production overseas is taking place. You don't have to own your own plant. Someone else owns that plant and has the capital expenditure and in in comp uh, takes on board the risk. So the lower operation costs, you are no, so there are lower operation costs, you no longer are responsible for raw materials and energy sources, and you simply pay a fixed fee for what is produced. And you no longer have the responsibility to maintain worker conditions, safety standards, or the liability for all the workers in your factory. Uh, offshore production was about getting into developing countries with an educational workforce, but labor was consistently and considerably cheaper than in the U.S., and this is where you save the most costs. 
Now, jobs exported overseas roughly amounted to 28 million jobs in a 20-year period. I should point out that these jobs were replaced in the U.S. economy, but not in the manufacturing sector, uh, simply within the service sector, or white-collar uh, positions in some cases, but also traditional kind of service work in restaurants, hair salons, uh, and what have you. So we, as a nation, became deindustrialized, transformed from a material production-based economy toward a service service-oriented economy. And you can see a massive decline here in the apparel industry, where the jobs have been relocated to developing countries, where labor is cheaper, and they so you can outsource and offshore the production of uh, apparel commodities. Uh, many of these companies decided uh, to go off, where they decided to, to go was based off of information like this. This chart is a good representation of showing countries with cheap or expensive labor forces and the type of business environment in that country. Uh, and so uh, really what we're talking about here is identifying these countries here that had um, lower standards of living, uh, but were able to produce skilled labor enough to produce garments. And so you can look at this financial attractiveness as an example of how companies would rather objectively look at data and harness data to identify places to locate uh, manufacturing plants. So what's good about this is that capital no longer has borders. We are living in a borderless world. And this book, book points out why China is such an attractive place for cheap labor. And in this graph, you can see anticipated rise in the GDP of China and America. And where they, uh, where they intersect is roughly now. Uh, and the anticipation is because of the offshoring of the world, the Chinese GDP is going to rise and the U.S. is also, but not to the same degree. And so you can see here huge, a huge upswing in Chinese manufacturing as opposed to the U.S. output of manufacturing. Now, because China has become the manufacturing capital for the world, in many different industries, there is an emergence of cities devoted to certain manufacturing. There's a specialization, if you will, within cities for many different brands distributed around the world. China is the manufacturing heart of the contemporary world. China, if not now, in the next couple of decades, will take over as the most important manufacturing hub from the U.S. in the global economy. It doesn't mean it will stay that way. Things are always uh, up for grabs. Just like the U.S. economy developed and changed, there is a good chance that the Chinese economy and society will transform away from being a manufacturing epicenter in the future. It may take half a century. It may take longer than that. But it's likely over the next 50 years, China will become, or has already become, some might argue, the center for the, uh, in, uh, the manufacturing uh, economy. So global commodity chains then. The post-industrial era is characterized by information technology, knowledge economies, and service economies. And as it says here, it's about the networked office rather than coal or steam power and sprawling workshops. So there's been a shift from industrial production to post-industrial production, or the industrial economy to the post-industrial economy. And we've gone from dirty to clean technologies. Uh, Blue-collar work was replaced by white-collar work, radically different forms than uh, maybe what your parents or grandparents would uh, see in their life expected of labor. Uh, so one has declined blue-collar manufacturing positions, and the other has inclined in service or knowledge economies. And remember, 78% of work is in that service, knowledge, and information sector. And within that economy, you have different energy sources or motors of production. And what you can see here is that we've shifted from dirty to clean technologies. We go from coal and oil through electricity and atomic and nuclear to ultimately digital. And arguably, it's digital information that drives the economy within a post-industrial era. It's what uh, is the source or the input uh, in the uh, post-industrial capitalist economy. Information technology or IT economies are driven by digital information and are cost effective because they require less investment in mass labor. It requires less raw materials to go through it and to drive the economy. It's a smarter workforce rather than a massive labor workforce. Clean technology, they think and work, white color service sector positions are effective and more cost effective. So if we think about uh, Twitter as a, a, a great example of 
a dominant company or corporation within the service or IT economy, really all of its production, the content that is produced on Twitter is effectively outsourced or democratized to all the individual users. So Twitter as a company produces this experience, but really isn't responsible for generating any of the labor or spending the hours uh, and time to create that content. It's effectively sort of um, uh, outsourced. And so Twitter as a, a, an example of this service sector economy is worth hundreds of billions of dollars, uh, but it doesn't really uh, require the same level of input uh, controlled directly from the manufacturer. And so on the left side, it's the industrial corporation. It's about the mechanized industries of mass workforces that were material or resource-based. They were physical, and they were physically turning raw materials into goods. It was very uh, driven by a mechanized, highly rationalized process. Now, within the post-industrial corporation, the actual material of the production uh, of those socks would be offshored, and you would be producing the meanings associated with those socks, the images of those socks, the brand identity of those socks. That's what a worker in a post-industrial corporation would focus on. So it wouldn't be a basic commodity. It would be a brand with symbolic meaning. It's a culture industry, if you will. Uh, and so we can think about even the production of cars and sportswear apparel and footwear. It's If you're getting a job with one of those companies today, you, that job would look very different than it would a decade or maybe even a generation ago. It's a culture industry now, and the responsibility would be uh, for brand marketers to create symbolic meanings associated with that product rather than actually creating the product in and of itself. And Nike was kind of on the forefront of this, and it admitted 22 or maybe 25 years ago uh, that it was a post-industrial company. They aren't focused on the production of the actual material. Rather, Nike is a marketing company. They are market-oriented, and they are market, uh, marketing products by engaging the values and views of the marketplace and creating products and brands that the market wants. So an industrial corporation would produce a boot like the one on the left, and Nike would produce a boot like the one on the right based on the brand and the meaning. It's not necessarily about the production of material goods. It's about the production of cultural meanings linked to those material goods. If you were to work for Nike, that's ultimately what your job would be. You wouldn't be producing the boot itself. You wouldn't be producing it in the factory. You would be producing the meanings associated with it. How would you do that? Well, you might be working for social media. You might be linked to the advertising industry. Because Nike, as the paragon of a post-industrial corporation, is all about the production of culture and the production of meaning in the post-industrial economy. So a good example, of course, is Nike, and it spends roughly $3 billion a year on essentially marketing costs, because that's its core product. It produces images and meanings through marketing. Uh, this post-industrial transportation has a real knock-on effect for the spatial relocation of an industry. As I've uh, intimated, there's a shift from industrial to post-industrial production, and focus is all about the offshoring of material and mass manufacturing. The post-industrial corporation focuses on demand creation rather than material creation. Again, demand creation rather than material condition. So in 1968, it was we make stuff. 1978, we have others make our stuff. In 88, we allow others to make our... To, uh, we allow others to have our others make our stuff. And today, we make websites for others who have others make our stuff. So this kind of... This funny comic... Um, exemplifies this transition within the post-industrial uh, economy. Because of that, we are seeing the emergence of global commodity chains. And here's a great quote on that. The, the chain is essentially a network, a network of different processes that are linked together that end up creating an end product for the user or the consumer in the marketplace. And here we see the transformation in global, uh, in, in, in the world, uh, in terms of commodity chains as we shift from an industrial to post-industrial era. In the industrial era, we see all the different nodes that go into the creation of a product by a corporation. Within the post-industrial corporation, the corporation focuses less on the labor intensities node, nodes, but rather focuses on the orange, which 
I th which is the uh, think work, if you will. It's less about the material manufacturing and more about the cultural manufacturing. The blue in the bottom chain is generally outsourced. So it shows a radical change in the last 50 years in what commodity chains look like. And here we see there are different movements or different components within that commodity chain. And different places take place in different locations. Arguably, the reason being that they have that they take place is in different locations is based on the nature of development of the global economy and the wage structure within different locations. For example, in the electronics industry, you need a more high-level manufacturing labor force rather than a more basic product. And so we can see something like this, uh, the commodity chain of a Lego brick and how it sort of moves around the globe in terms of its manufacturing, its branding, its distribution, uh, going through multiple factories throughout the process. So take a, take a look at this commodity chain of a singular Lego, and I think it is a great illustration of how all these things link together. And of course, this branded logo up here speaks volumes. Uh, it tells us about the entire production process. It produces, this logo here produces a particular set of meanings that represents this entire process. So you know, as a consumer, what to expect, whether you buy a Lego in China or whether you buy a Lego product in London or in the United States. Uh, similarly, we have the Nutella global commodity chain. So here is a consumable good uh, in the food, food industry. And you can look at all the different factories, the suppliers, and kind of imagine all these things linked together through various diffuse networks uh, and relations of production. So looking back at Nike, it's a great example of the post-industrial commodity chain, just like Nutella and Legos. The things in the orange are located in all, uh, all in Europe or in the U.S., and what's in the blue box is located in the global economic periphery. Uh, there is a spatial dividing up of, of or within Nike's commodity chains. I would even argue that some of the things in the orange are now being uh, offshored uh, to uh, foreign markets. Uh, it speaks to that localization process because if you really want to advertise uh, products for um, Chinese markets or uh, Japanese markets, you need to have some sort of local context there. So we see advertising uh, and retail also outsourced with out, uh, outside of the United States. So even uh, it, as the economy continues to work and expand, some of the knowledge production and knowledge cultural service sector jobs are also existing outside of the U.S. So here's a more specific example of all Nike does, and I think it's worth uh, considering Nike as a core company, or a company in the core as a U.S. multinational, and its role in the an actual uh, manufacturing process, which largely occurs in the periphery. And so we can see Nike's world campus is in Beaverton, Oregon, where all the research, design, and production of information occurs. That research, design, and, and production information gets sent to a kind of distribution or a headquarters in Southeast Asia, which then spreads to all the different manufacturing centers uh, where the actual core production will take place. And that's in Taiwan, Korea, Thailand, China, Indonesia, and a various other so uh, areas where production for their commodities take place. So this is, on the one hand, the product information flow. We also have specialty component flow, and so these are uh, a less general information on Nike, the products that it requires, but a direct result of its specialized uh, research and development that also flows along these networks to the production centers. Thirdly, we have the product distribution flow, and the product then leaves through a main hub or distribution center of manufacturing and goes to global hubs that are then distributed to the various regions. And then you have marketing consumption, uh, and that can let Nike know what is being sold when and where and at any time. So the flow of information or inventory flows back to Nike. And then lastly, then Nike can use this information, its sales information, to tell manufacturers what is being sold, what needs to be made, and sent in various locations around the world. And the interesting thing about this entire process is that the speed and reach of it has accelerated uh, at a faster rate than ever before, whereas this entire process may take... Um, months or years or, or even weeks, it now can be done in a single day. You can get up to the time information or inventory adjustments through just-in-time delivery that when one pair of shoes is sold in New Zealand, um, 
Then all the way back in headquarters, Nike knows that, and they can see trends through the use of data analytics to quicker or to more quickly release further product information flow back to the uh, centers to increase production. And so this happens all at once, it's overlapping, and it's almost instantaneous delivery of information. So the fact that Nike's production and exchange of information and knowledge is in real time and on a global scale, that's what makes Nike a great example of being a post-industrial corporation. It's interesting that Nike's commodity chain is that sophisticated and has that much information and that many flows between core periphery and semi-periphery nations. So clearly you can see in the commodity chain example, there is an evident division of sporting industry labor that we can identify. Different parts of the world simply are responsible for different parts of the value chain. There are different types of work carried out and very different financial rewards are earned along these chains, whether you, there are, they are material workers in the periphery or knowledge and cultural workers in the core. So what this does is it exemplifies uh, the distinction between developed core and consumer economies and semi-peripheral uh, producer economies. And I think this is an interesting chart that looks at the consumer economies but also the producer economies. It's not to say that there aren't consumers in some of these producer economies and that there aren't producers in some of these consumer economies, but I think largely speaking we have consumer economies at the core and producer economies uh, on the periphery. Consumer economies are in green and producing economies are in orange and the wage rates and skill levels are much higher in the consumer economies than the producer economies. So think about that. If we're looking at Nike, it's the embedding of meanings and the brand creation that is far more valuable, therefore, to the production process than the actual material production of the goods. So think about that in terms of hierarchy in the global economy. What we are privileging based on the amount of wages that workers earn in consumer-based economies uh, and those knowledge workers is that that's the priority here. And I think it's interesting and telling because many of the products we buy are indistinguishable from one another, whether it be Adidas or Nike or Puma or even a discount brand of shoes that you might get at a discount retailer. What is different is the brand meaning and associations. That's what makes it distinct, even though a lot of times the products from competitors are made in the exact same offshore uh, factory in Southeast Asia. So that's why we see much higher wages for the producers of uh, meanings and the con uh, producer uh, within core economies because ultimately that's what makes a product distinguishable from one another and desirable among consumers. That's what we value, in other words, in society. So Nike truly has a global workforce, nearly a million people worldwide. And of course, Nike subcontracts its manufacturing to other companies, which means there are many more million workers that are part of the Nike global commodity chain, but aren't considered actual employees of Nike. Uh, and the same factory producing Nikes can be making Adidas or other sporting goods for other companies. And what makes them distinct are the layers of meanings and the associations that get branded on top of them through this global commodity chain. There's an international division of labor and wealth within that workforce. Mass production on the periphery producing the goods and little more, uh, on little more than subsistence wages. Low wage economies and Nike pays little more than subsistence wages to the workers who actually make the products. Uh, and it keeps the products as cheap as possible. On the other side, knowledge and cultural production in the core it has a highly developed and rewarding wage structure. So there's a big distinction because after, war, uh, uh, in, uh, after all, that's what Nike is valuing. It's the ability to produce knowledge and culture are associated with a product rather than the actual product itself. Now you can see the evolving supply of networks through Nike, that initially all the products were made in the US or Japan, uh, and that search for ever more cheaper labor forced Nike to explore cheaper markets in Korea and Taiwan, but as the standard of living in Korea and Taiwan increased, Nike would move its production to even cheaper areas. They would ex they explore China, Thailand, Indonesia, and we see sort of Nike uh, as globe trotters around the world seeking out through its various networks and flows the absolute cheapest labor as possible. And as Nike creates a factory there, even if it's on subsistence wages, the living 
standards of those workers increases and uh, it begins to price out labor beyond what Nike can find at its lowest cost. And so they continue to explore different areas of the world to find the cheapest labor and it's um, exemplified in this chart. The question is, where does it go next? As Vietnam and Cambodia become developed economies, do we see Nike exploring Africa or South Central America as a potential destination for the manufacturing of its actual products? So Nike exemplifies the manner in which post-industrial global corporations act as a form of what we call footloose capital, searching the globe for competitive advantage. Nike doesn't have any particular investment in these countries where their products are manufactured, but rather an investment in making shareholders the most profit. At the end of the year, what all that is all that Nike cares about is making its shareholders as much money as possible. In fact, that is their legal requirement. If they told their shareholders, well, we didn't make as much money as possible, but we felt like we gave something back to these communities. In fact, if that message was conveyed by the CEO, the shareholders would vote that CEO out uh, immediately because that's what they need. That, that, that is the requirement by the laws of sort of global capitalism uh, and by the cert, uh, certificate of incorporation that the duty of the CEO is to make as much profit for its shareholders as humanly possible. So they continue to look for ways to gain the greatest competitive advantage in the marketplace and it, uh, this concept, so looking in terms of footwear then, this is the main source of footwear uh, in terms of the three countries uh, for Nike. So 96% of footwear for Nike is made in Vietnam, China, and Indonesia. Uh, there are some independent factories list, uh, that are listed here on the bottom, uh, and they also produce products for sale in their own countries uh, rather than simply just the three countries uh, listed here. But the main core uh, in terms of uh, Nike's production occur for its shoes in these three countries. Uh, for apparel, it's similar. However, you cannot get the same type of percentages. Uh, it's not publicly available. It's made in more factories in more countries, but a similar type of developing uh, in, in semi-periphery or periphery nations uh, that are responsible for the apparel, apparel manufacturing as well. But to really understand what's going on, we have to look at the breakdown of the cost of a shoe. It's virtually impossible to get that information, but we have to look at really an old study to figure out the entire cost of this commodity chain production. Even though this study was done in 1995, the data is old, and you really won't get uh, be able to get a Nike Air Pegasus at $70 today. Uh, so the cost isn't exactly the same. The production cost percentages will relatively remain the same. So in other words, the absolute cost might change. A Nike Air Pegasus may cost $100 today, but the percentage breakdown is roughly the same. So you can see the marketing cost about 22%, retailing cost 49%, and the production cost about 29%. Uh, and, and here you can see uh, how kind of Nike's Air Pegasus, the marketing cost, gets broken down even further. Uh, so of the 15, 50, or 22%, this is what goes into it. And if we look at the retailing cost, which is the cost of selling to the consumer, uh, they pay per, for personnel, rent, other operating profit. Uh, suffice it to say, every product that you buy in a store is roughly double what that store purchased the product from the wholesaler from. So if you find a Nike Air Pegasus for $70 at Dick's Sporting Goods, for instance, it roughly meant that Dick's Sporting Goods purchased that Nike Air Pegasus from a distributor of Nike or Nike itself for around, for around $35. Uh, and these are, again, the costs that Nike pays to its subcontractors. What's in yellow, it's the la workforce labor. So this is really what we're going to focus on. So out of the entire production cost of a $70 shoe, only $2.75 goes to the actual workforce labor. So out of $70, uh, really about 5% goes to the worker who made that shoe. And so what happens to that 275 is that it's shared between the various workers that make up that entire shoe. And a study came up with the Air Max Penny, and again, this is a long time ago, nearly, uh, or over 20 years ago. Um, they don't make the shoe anymore, but it was made in five different countries, and it touched 120 pairs of hands that split that $2.75 to make that shoe. So we have 120 people sharing that $2.75. Uh, so you'd be getting roughly two and a half cents for the production of one single shoe that sells for uh, $70. So think about that. And again, think about this in terms of economics. The cost of a product 
comes down to the intersections between supply and demand. So while the cost to produce that product is important, ultimately what the consumer pays in the marketplace is based on their demand. Hence why knowledge workers and the creation of brand and culture associated with Nike is so important. That what the, what the consumer is expecting to pay has little to do with the actual labor costs embodied in that product or used to produce that product, but all about the associated brands and meanings uh, that are linked to it based on this logo here, the Nike swoosh. And so it's about supply and demand that comes uh, that, that is belying the price of $70 that we pay in the first place. So this is the average pay for garment workers in these particular places, and there's a huge disparity here. And notice China is on the high end of labor costs. And so unless the Chinese uh, workers are offering some sort of special specialized skill, uh, it would be likely that the owner or a, a businessman or woman would look to some of these cheaper areas to manufacture these products, uh, all things being equal. And this is... Uh, what is being paid recently in different settings for Nike workers. Nike workers are paying more, are, are, are paid more than garment workers for the most part. Uh, but these are very low labor costs compared to if you're citing the manufacturing costs in the U.S. Production costs would make up roughly 50% of the overall cost if made in the U.S. as opposed to being very little, about 2% uh, in other countries. And so, there are very real arguments for offshoring that benefit uh, the sports industry. Now, whether the savings get passed on to the consumer, that may be a different question because ultimately the consumer pays what they demand for a product rather than what it costs to make it. So the first one here, of course, is that um, the American wage structure is indeed unrealistic in that an American worker would demand too much for the manufacturing process and those labor costs would be quite high and still reflected to some degree in the retail prices. So uncompetitive labor costs make the U.S. manufacturing really not all that practical in today's day and age. So relocation is almost an economic necessity if you want to produce cheaply priced or reasonably priced commodities. Uh, you're all... Uh, also, as the argument would go, providing consistent income to the periphery instead of them working in agriculture and uh, living impoverished lives. They are getting more than the national average in many of these factories, and so uh, they make more by working in the offshore subcontract subcontracted factory than they would in agricultural work. So in doing so, they contribute to the local economy, there's social development that takes place, and there is even more wealth created by these opportunities from these subcontract fa subcontracted factories that benefit the local society. So these are some of the arguments for that factories often implement codes of conduct that are um, experienced uh, among people working in these factories, uh, and so they are um, perhaps better than factories where these global commodity chains don't exist and they're locally owned and not linked to a global multinational that gets a high level of scrutiny like Nike. So perhaps the argument is that the conditions are slightly better in a subcontracted Nike factory than in any other factory in uh, these countries. Uh, and in these books, uh, he describes how sweatshops are an important part of the development process within the global economy. Uh, it's part of a national development process, Powell argues, that leads to better economic and social conditions. And as those jobs sort of leave it, through that footloose capital production, it suggests that the uh, social standard of living has improved to such a degree that the workers who would have worked in these uh, pretty poor conditions at one time are now uh, living better and more improved lives and transitioning, perhaps in some cases, uh, such as Japan, from uh, manufacturing economies toward uh, knowledge economies as well. Uh, and there's also a discussion in here about empowering women and giving them a form of upward mobility by working in these factories. So these are some of the arguments for. And now, here's what we're going to look at is we're going to take a quite critical look at the notion of what we call the invisible worker on the periphery. Uh, and so we're going to look at maybe some of the arguments against the offshoring of sporting goods production. Because, of course, as we know, global corporations relocate to the periphery uh, because of some of these things. Uh, they've re relocated production because of a lower standard of living uh, and lower workplace regulations that are uh, not as stringent as they are in the developed world. So simply the rules and regulations which sometimes can hamper production uh, but are done for safety of the worker aren't the same in some of the peripheral or semi-peripheral countries as they are in the U.S. and Europe. And it's also common practice to hire women and child labor in these countries on extremely low wages because men tend to be paid at a higher level than women. So it's encouraged 
uh, and children are, of course, paid less than women. Uh, so there's a clear wage structure by hiring women and children and relocating jobs to these countries saves companies a lot of money. By doing so, this the argument holds, keeps prices low, and the core consumers want the product now and cheap, and this is what it does. It, it, it's not inflating the price of products due to high production and high labor costs if the labor were to occur in the uh, global economic core. And so this is what we call sweatshop labor. And there are various definitions of it, uh, but these are the characteristics of it. It's relatively low skilled, repetitive work. Uh, work. It's a workforce dominated by women who are poorly paid, work long hours with forced overtime. They often su uh, suffer sexual harassment or physical abuse in quite unsafe or cramped working conditions. So the key that I want you to focus on is this concept, that, that there is no or little union representation. And while there has been a discussion about a global minimum wage that should be imposed to ensure um, that these types of sweatshop conditions aren't reproduced around the world, uh, the complex issue with this is that there are that there is relative difference between some of these economies. So far be it from uh, somebody in the core or for, for someone in the global north of the U.S. to determine what wages should be uh, desirable among these workers because it may lead to ultimately those sh um, factories from closing down. The key here is with local union representation, those workers can collectively bargain with the employers what is determined to be a satisfactory wage, satisfactory conditions that are relatively uh, or culturally determined. So that's why union representation is key in many of these areas because it's an ability for the workers to determine and set criteria for their conditions that are locally and contextually defined. And these bo books talk about invisible bodies because as a consumer within the core, they are relatively indivis indivisible to us. Uh, think about when you go and buy a product. Do you look to see where it's manufactured? Do you imagine what the worker's experience was like and what the worker's conditions were like that actually created that product that you purchased? When we wear the shoes, the clothes, we don't have good images of who these people are and what their lives look like uh, as they manufacture the products for us. Uh, and I, oftentimes such low wages that can make it affordable for us, but perhaps in our consumption, we're furthering their own exploitation. So the argument is that the global sweatshop worker is invisible to us. It's mainly a woman or a child, but we don't know anything about them. But over the last decade, we've had more exposure into what sweatshop work is, and a lot of research and reporting has been done in bringing these people's lives and stories to the public and to our eyes. The video uh, like this gives a good sense of uh, women issues with child labor and within the garment apparel factory. So within the documentary segment, they are looking at young female workers and their setting in Cambodia. And there are another a number of other examples like this. So I encourage you to kind of take a moment uh, and as you are working on your discussion response, see if you can find other uh, examples of documentaries uh, where they go to the factories where many of these commodities are produced and they examine the social and material conditions of the workers. Uh, the sweatshop issue here involves or revolves around workers' human rights that are severely compromised by the regimes. There is little or no choice for these workers. It's simply uh, work in this exploitative environment or uh, quite literally uh, fail to um, you know, have a subsistence uh, lifestyle. So um, you know, as we talk about choice, I think whether or not those workers have a choice to kind of be exploited in these conditions or not be exploited, uh, when your only choice is to be exploited or to uh, quite literally starve, that's what we call a Hobson's choice. And it effectively means through kind of legal systems around the world that it is not a choice at all. And so what we need to think about are wor workers' human rights and whether or not the quote unquote choice to uh, exchange your labor for your labor for money in these settings is truly a choice to begin with. And so there are structures and rules within these sweatshops located within that global commodity chain that create to the exploitation, uh, that further the exploitation of these workers. Now Nike has a very detailed code of conduct for its manufacturing plants and it has so for a number of years. 
uh, and they are very visible and commendable. However, many of times these codes aren't followed by the subcontractors. Nike can wash their hands of these human rights abuses because after all, they don't own the factories where the products are taking place. Um, and so, uh, and of course, Nike is a globally visible corporation. And where Nike may be at the kind of front end these days, after many, many years of criticism, uh, they may have these codes of conduct and they may be doing very good work. It's the companies that we haven't heard of, the uh, non-name brand companies that are sold for uh, really cheap uh, rates in the U.S., uh, whether you buy shoes at discount retailers uh, or apparel at discount retailers, those are where many of the human rights abuses take place because we don't quite know the companies uh, that are producing them or even subcontracting out to those local uh, workers. So Nike is, is very good in this regard uh, and is very clear and transparent and has transparent mechanisms for evaluating what's going on within its manufacturing plant. After years and years of criticism, uh, Nike kind of has emerged as perhaps, some might argue, a world leader in creating policies and standards and practices to ensure its products are made in non-exploitative conditions. Uh, similarly, Adidas has done uh, a similar thing. But again, I want you to think about those are Ni that's Nike and Adidas, and because they have such big, globally visible brand identities, um, they can afford to spend a little bit more on its labor. They can offer a double the wages, so it might uh, they might be able to offer uh, double the wages of uh, a, a non-name brand company and ensure that the uh, conditions are relatively safe for the workers. Whereas the, it's the companies that you haven't heard of, but the products that you may buy nonetheless, where these practices are far more abusive and exploitative. And we can see here the results of how many factors within the Nike system are evaluated. Uh, they were actually gold and silver and bronze, which make up the majority of factories. So maybe Nike uh, has emerged as perhaps a leader of um, ensuring human rights uh, for its manufacturing of material goods. So the majority of those reasons, according to Nike, were either the hours related to how long people were expected to work, uh, and the wages that they were pay paid. So perhaps their own compliance effect isn't uh, the most effective. There are examples of um, wages being too low or issues of non-compliance here within the system uh, that um, Nike needs to address further. The good thing is that at least Nike has a set of standards that they can evaluate their own factories. Now, whether they do it on a consistent basis, whether they evaluate all their factories, we're not exactly sure. And so this documentary looks at whether Nike actually complies with, the own with their own standards for uh, manufacturing their products. And you can see from these documents from the workers', workers rights consortiums, which are independent and not uh, produced in the inherent self-interest of Nike, the apparel industry more generally uh, over the past 10 years, there have been a change in wages in these countries for apparel workers. So you can see sort of some of the effects and some of the places where the wages are going up. So as we start thinking about the truth and separating the truth from fiction, we want that independence. We want human uh, rights consortiums or human rights watch to produce independent evaluations of these subcontracted factories that present objective information and objectively assess whether or not Nike, Adidas, or any other apparel or footwear manufacturer is truly living up to their standards. However, the same research says that despite wage increases, it shows that wages are still significantly lower than the cost of standard of the standard of living. So what we need is therefore to uh, compare the costs uh, to produce these products and the wages given to those workers with the standard of living in these local economies. So despite improvements and real weight, uh, uh, a real uh, rise in the living wage, it's still below the standard of living. So why is child labor a problem? Well, the answer should be self-evident, but uh, the United Nations identifies child labor being a problem for these reasons, education, recreation, and health. It denies children the basic fundamental human rights of quite literally being a child. It puts child into employment uh, at too young of an age, and it limits their ab ability to grow physically, mentally, and emotionally. Those things are hampered by this. So children who are put into labor too young do not develop correctly, and it hurts society in general because there is a generation lacking education and healthy functioning adults who can contribute to society. So the argument here is that child labor leads to further underdevelopment of many of these economies. And you can see some of these images here that there are many children involved in the global 
uh, production of a soccer ball. So think about this soccer ball being produced by this child laborer, maybe eight years old, that many other children around the world can use and enjoy for their own physical activity. Uh, and this is uh, cited largely in the area of India, where it estimated more than 10,000 children stitch soccer balls here, and a number of them more around the world. So why soccer balls and why children? Because basically, children's hands are small enough to do the tight and complex sewing work that is needed to stitch a soccer ball. Uh, but stitching something as rugged and tough with something like that, like the material of a soccer ball, it actually causes a lot of pain for children. They develop arthritis uh, at a very, very early age. And so not only emotionally and mentally are they denied their basic human rights, but physically it leads to uh, physical degradation and arguably abuse. However, there are also various types of centers for stitching soccer balls uh, within this area of in India. The biggest factories don't essentially use child labor. The smallest ones don't either. The household units is where there is a problem. The jobs are brought from the factories, factories and factory workers to families who are very poor and in desperate need of money, so they ask their kids to help. Uh, they are not registered, there's no safety, there's no monitoring, there's no oversight of these conditions. It's very unhygienic, and there are quite poor working conditions for these children who are expected to produce a massive amount of soccer balls in a relatively short period of time. So this is the process to make these balls and who makes them. Uh, and as you can see, the child labor uh, is the most delicate, small scale. It's the stitching part, and it's mostly done by uh, young children and oftentimes women with small hands. So we have the figures uh, related to the area of India that we're talking about. And so you can look at um, the impact of uh, child labor activity in the football stitching industry. Uh, and this is for girls compared to the graph before for boys. And you can see from it, it's a sizable portion of the child population that is staying home and working. And it's more, more likely if you are a girl than if you are a boy. So what type of effect does this have and how much are they working? 45% uh, of the child workforce is working more than six hours a day. So it's not just stitching soccer balls on the side. It is their primary responsibility, in other words. So clearly it's not beneficial for children to be working at all, especially with no public health system or public education for them to be taken care of. But they're doing so in such, unhazardous, uh, such hazardous conditions and for so many hours per day. So here's the quote from Amnesty International. Uh, a game that is supposed to inspire youth and entertain the world must not be played with footballs sewn by the sweat of children. And it's not just soccer balls. Here's a very good video about Aussie rules football, uh, and that's made similar, uh, that's brought to light the similar issue uh, in, uh, in, in a similar way. And what we're looking at then really is that there's an inequality and the interconnections of soccer become an opportunity for children in the developed world uh, but a form of child abuse and exploitation in the developing world. So this soccer ball embodies the production of this little girl here that was whose hands were used to stitch that soccer ball for the enjoyment of this young boy in the developed economy. Again, think of commodities as embodied representations of the labor process and all the labor throughout that goes into it, both in terms of the stitching, the sewing, the design, the distribution, and how this soccer ball comes from idea to manufactured commodity delivered across the world from its production areas to the store that this family can purchase a, a soccer ball for this young boy. That all of that per process, all those global networks and flows are quite literally represented in this singular product on the soccer pitch. So there are a number of protest organizations that are trying to raise the issue of uh, child labor in the garment industry, in the footwear industry, in the sports apparel industry, and in the manufacturing of footballs, uh, trying to reduce or cut out child labor within it. And it's had some success, but it's still going on within the Indian economy. And you may have seen this in the news recently. Um, uh, this fellow here, uh, Satyari the he won the Nobel Peace Prize for raising awareness of child labor within uh, India. And we know that there is an unknown amount of child labor in the football industry. And we know once that the industry is exposed in one area, it generally moves to somewhere else that is less high profile and less regulated. So activists are needed to remain vigilant to see where this product ends up. So there are bad things about child labor. It should be self-evident. 
but I think it's important that we have these folks shed a light onto it. Uh, and all those bad things are embodied by the commodity when it enters the core uh, nation or the or is purchased by a core consumer in Western countries. That that ball uh, represents all the different hands that have touched it and minds that have been used to create it throughout the process, including in this case uh, w women uh, and ch children uh, in the labor process. So in summary, then, uh, what I think this demonstrates is that if we look at uh, as core developed world consumers, there are things that we po purchase that you're uh, effectively wearing uh, that come from a different place. And it's very likely that if you purchased it, you, do, you don't have an idea of where it's made or an, any idea of the manufacturing process and how that product came into being from those periphery countries. So this links us to this broader system, the system of developed core and peripheral nations. So in other words, that developed consumer is closely interconnected with the semi-periphery or per periphery producer in multiple ways through the production uh, process and their process of consumption. We are connected to them. If things change in the periphery country, it will have effect on the core consumer and vice versa. So what can be done? I think the first step for all of you is to sort of make this linkage to understand that those genes that you may see on the rack in the store uh, represent the entire developing world's production process, uh, that that commodity is representing the workers on that end so that you can produce, uh, that you can consume these products and enjoy them. So think about that. On the other hand, it's up to you as the consumer to ask about this process, to ask about the division of labor and how that product arrived on that store shelf that you are considering buying and everything that went into that process. Some of the information can be obtained, some of it can't be. There are some companies that prioritize and make known that they produce their products in humane conditions, pay their workers fair wages, and while those products may cost more, and indeed consumers, ironically, are willing to pay slightly more if they know those products are made in humane conditions, it's up to you to prioritize that. So the next time you're, you see a product on the shelf, you see two competing products, one is $5 cheaper than the other, will you always purchase the cheapest one? Or will you try and investigate and research whether or not that cheapest one is indeed cheaper because of a lower manufacturing cost uh, throughout the process? And maybe the worker that produced that cheaper shoe actually earned a cheaper wage uh, overall. So is your consumption ultimately leading to the exploitation and the oppression of these people who made that commodity in the first place? Now, I'm not saying you shouldn't purchase commodities or products that you find on store shelves. But I think it's incumbent upon all of us in these Western consumer-driven uh, economies to just question and try as best we can to identify the international division of labor here in the post-industrial economy. Ask those questions, and then it's up to you as a consumer to decide whether you want to purchase a particular product based on this information. So that's it for this lecture. You can move on to the required readings and discussion responses, complete your quiz, and decide whether or not to complete the topic assignment for this uh, lecture.